The Bible says in Psalms 145.4, says, Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts and let them proclaim your power. Matthew 28, 19 says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. We have a responsibility to make disciples. We also have a responsibility to pass on the faith to the next generation. Uh, And, you know, generally folks that are children are easier disciples because you know what? They haven't made the same mistakes that we've made, right? Right? Their heart isn't quite as hard as our our heart. And so these two commands that the Lord's given us is not something that God's going, you know, I just wish they'd do that. It should be nice. It would be a nice idea if they did it. It's a command that says, hey, we need your help. And so there's a few things that we focus on with our kids' ministry and it's, it's we always want to increase our quality, and we also want to increase our quantity. And we want people to understand how important children's ministry is and ministry to youth and such. Now, a few things I want to let you know. With the, Do we have the presentation? Okay. All right, the total population of Walton County... It's 94,740. Now, that's going to be more. That's based on the last census, and we're in, what, 2019, right? Okay, so we've got a census coming up, and it's going to be, a, it's going to be way over 100,000 people. Within a 10-mile radius of this church, there's 48,000 people that are unchurched. I want you to think about that. 10-mile radius, 40. 8,000 people. So it's going to be well over 50,000 this next census. Now the ages of the break, breakdown, if you look at this, from ages 0 to 19, 28% of the population. That's the largest swatch of the population. Total population is around 26,000. We don't know what percentage is unchurched. 20 to 29 There's almost 11,000, 96% are unchurched. There's 10,000 unchurched in that age group. 30 to 39, there's 11,000, almost 12,000 people in that age group. 85% are unchurched. A little over 10,000 are unchurched in that age group. 40 to 49, there's 12,000, almost 13,000 in that age group. 85% are unchurched. That means there's 10,000. In a 10 mile radius of this building. 50 to 59, 13,000, 65% are unchurched. There's 8,000. 60 to 65 uh, is 5.4%. 65% are unchurched. 3,000. 65 and up. 4,000 unchurched. For a total of 48,163 people within the margin of error. Within a 10-mile radius of this building. Let me tell you, we are in a fight for souls. This is about heaven and hell. This is about eternity. This is the epic battle of the ages. And the largest group of people are between 0 and 19, which make up 28%. And the easiest people to reach are also... The largest group. But you know what? If you want to reach the next three age brackets. You know what people from 20 to 29, from 30 to 39, and from 40 to 49 care about absolutely most, more than anything in this world? It's their kids. Do you know what people between the age of 50 and 59 and 60 and up care more about than anything? They're grandkids. There's people that are in this church that go to this church because they're having to raise their grandkids and they're coming because of the kids' ministry. There's people that's in these age groups that are coming because of the kids' ministry. And 
and we want to give our best and we want to do our best to help reach these people and to disciple these people when they're at their youngest and most impressionable age. Now, four ways we can all help. First of all, is we want you to pray. Say pray. There's no junior Holy Spirit. Kids can move in the power of God and the touch of God. And we need outpouring in there just like we need in here. We want to see the power of God poured out. We also need you to pray for laborers. Say laborers. laborers. This morning when I was in the prayer room, the Lord, Lord spoke to me while I was up there, and I shared this, and we, we prayed into it. But the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you've entered into a season of harvest as a church. And he said, if you continue to offer me prayer, if you continue to serve, and if you continue to give, there's nothing that can stop you from reaching the harvest. The only people that can stop you is yourself. And what I'm asking for is we need folks that can help us in these, these particular areas. We need you to pray. We also, second thing you can do is disciple your kids. Like we have the app that you can download, uh, that you can go through. We give out the devotions. Rachel does the devotions with my kids at least two or three times during the mornings before school. We can't fully disciple your kids. That job belongs to the home, but we want to help you, and we're trying to resource you to do that. So disciple your kids and make Jesus the central part of your home. Third thing is short-term help. We're getting ready to come into summer break, and maybe you could help teach the class for the summer. Maybe you could help with the nursery, not forever, but just for the summer. Maybe you could help uh, take, they're, they're going to take some more of the kids to Warrior Fest again during the summer. Maybe you could help chaperone there. Maybe you could donate for a kid to go to camp. Whatever it is, maybe you can provide some short-term help. And then the next thing is become a core volunteer. There's some things that we need. We need first and second service nursery workers. We need one teacher for children's church rotation, maybe two. We need a craft and activity leader for the small groups. They break out, and they have little small groups where you, you, maybe you can't handle the whole group, but you could do a craft with a smaller group, and they could rotate. We need people that can work the soundboard for children's church. We need greeters for first-time guests at the check-in stations. We need a youth teacher and a youth helper. And I want you to get your card right here. And you know what? If you're, you're doing a ministry, like for instance, if you're in the sound booth, we can't move you anywhere else and you have a ministry. I mean, we need you there. You know what I'm saying? But if you're at a place, you know, I want you to look at this card and say, Holy Spirit, what would you have me do? How can I help? And if it's just praying, mark that. If it's discipling your kids and you're going to be intentional about that, I want you to do that. If it's short-term help, mark that card. And if it's one of these other things, it's a test drive. You're not signing up for sure. You might say, hey, I might try it and I might hate it. We're not going to lock you into it. We're just going to hook you up for a test drive and put you in there and say, hey, this is something that I, I'd like to help with. And so what I want is I want ushers to come forward again. You're going to be busy today. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> and even if you're just praying, I want you to just drop this. Drop this card in the, in the offering when it, when it goes by. Nothing else. We're not putting money in. We're just putting this in there. So, Father, I just pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you're going to provide laborers. Father, that you're going to provide people that can help, that can work, that can move, that can serve. Father, we bless you, we love you, we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All righty. When the off, that part, different kind of offering goes by, you should grab your Bible, turn to Luke 2.52. All right, now, guys, I'm going to tell you, I want y'all to do better than the first service did, okay? When I preached in the first service, some folks were sleeping a little bit. Some folks were really quiet. Some folks were not making eye contact at all. And there is more of a teaching element to the message today. However, if I say something that you can say, that's a good point. (laughs) That's a good thought. I needed that. Somebody needs to do that. I got it, Pastor. That works. I've tried something. Okay. Because... They about had me paranoid this morning, okay? I was like, I thought we took communion with Ambien. And so, so help me out here, okay? Because uh, I feel like this is some good information uh, if you put it to work, okay? But sometimes we got to go to school a little bit, all right? So let's, let's go to school. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, Okay. But before we do, this ties into the message because I don't want to be a person that tells you you ought to do something and doesn't tell you how to do something. There's a few. These are free. Okay. So it costs you anything. They're on the back table. Um, We have a private prayer guide. This kind of goes through the Lord's Prayer, walks you through how to pray the Lord's Prayer, gives you some things that you can fill in your prayer requests and how to do that, and will will guide you through how to have a, a solid prayer time if you've never done that. We've got a lot of people that's come in that's either gotten saved or hasn't been in church in a really long time. And so we want to help you in the process of praying. We also have this super creative uh, book called Self-Guided Discipleship Notebook. That was a joke. It was was like very creatively named, but you get the point of what it does. And this is, it has all kinds of doctrine and stuff, and you can go through And how it works is you look up the scripture, and you fill in the blank. You look up the scripture, you fill in the blank. You look up the scripture, you fill in the blank. If you're not sure that you have the right answer, their answers are in the back. Okay. But you got to get in the word. Okay. And you got to start learning the word and you got to put some effort into it. It doesn't cost you anything. Pick one up. We, we made them to give out. And then also we have uh, the 40 day spiritual journey talking about money, finances, stewardship, giving. And you're just going through the Bible. These are free. You can just go through and do that Bible study as well. Uh, They're free for you to use. So we want you to use those. And we're giving those out because if you're starting out the journey, you need to get in the Word. All right. Luke 2.52. I had it and then I put it back. And Jesus grew, let me see your fingers, in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Lord, I pray, Father, that you are going to release spiritual growth in this place, Father. I pray that we're going to be solid, that we're going to be rooted, that we're going to be biblical. Father, because if we're all spirit and no word, we'll blow up. And if we're all word and no spirit, we'll dry up. But if we're spirit and word, we will grow up. And so, Lord, I pray that you will help us to grow up in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. If you've ever watched the Olympics, then you've seen people do amazing things. Things that we could never do. But many of these people, even though they were born with a measure of talent, it wasn't the talent that they were born with that determined if they were going to be an Olympic athlete or not. It was the talent that God gave them combined with the training and the practice and the effort they put into being an athlete. You see, when you're an Olympic athlete, you have a plan for how you train and how you grow and how you develop. There's a detailed plan that tells you how to eat, how to run, how to stretch, how to exercise, how to think, how and when to practice. And this plan covers their whole life, not just the practice time. Because what they have for breakfast will affect how they practice, will affect how they perform in the moment. It's all-encompassing. And let me tell you something. Your spiritual life is no different. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Say that with me. Say, if I fail to plan, then I plan to fail. If you don't have a plan for your spiritual growth and your spiritual development, then you are going to stagnate and you're going to begin to go backwards. You've got to have a plan for your personal development and your personal growth within your life. Because if you don't have a plan, you will fail. Now, Jesus, his life gives us an example of how to grow spiritually. Now, it obviously you ask the question, why did Jesus have to grow spiritually? He's God, right? Let me give you a little bit of theology. Jesus is 100% God, but he's also 100% man. And when Jesus left heaven and climbed into mother, his mother's womb, Mary's womb, he wed himself to humanity where he became 100% man. So he's 100% God and he's 100% man. And to be Man, mankind, means you have to grow, you have to develop, you have to mature. It's part of being human. And if you don't agree with me, then that explains a lot. Okay. So to be fully human, you must grow and develop. And Jesus, Jesus' life gave us Four quadrants in which we are to develop our life. Four ways of, that we're to grow spiritually and holistically. And we want to follow Jesus' example. The scripture I read says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. Now that's why we call our children's ministry 252. It's Luke 252. You see, we have got to grow. We've got to have a plan for growth. And if we don't have a plan for growth, we're going to stagnate. So let me give you a few areas that we need to grow. First of all, you need to grow intellectually. Say intellectually. intellectually. Jesus grew mentally. Wisdom involves your mind. And let me tell you, Jesus was developing in his spiritual life long before he was baptized and started his ministry. He was at a place of mental development that when he was 12 years old, we get a picture of him in the temple. And he is with the PhDs of his day, the doctors of his day, and he is talking theology, and he is talking Bible, and he is talking ideas, and the scholars of his day were perplexed at this 12-year-old Jesus that knew the Word of God. This was a man that was developed mentally. This was a man that could give us the whole concept of the separation of church and state in one sentence, and he would say, give to God what is God, and give to Caesar's what is Caesar's. This, 
His words shaped all of Western civilization. And what we experience today uh, in, in our government, in our life, in our society, in our laws, the positive things that we have are rooted in the words and the teachings of Jesus. This was a man that was developed mentally. And you, my friends, are to grow intellectually. But also, Jesus was not just a man that knew theology. He was a carpenter. He had a skill. He had a trade. He, he understood commerce and how to, how to make money. He understood his field. Also, since Joseph is not mentioned in Jesus' later life, it's assumed that he died since he was older than Mary. And so Jesus was raising the family. He was raising the little brothers and sisters. He was working the family business. He was taking care of his mother, and we know he was taking care of his mother because at the cross when he died, he gave the responsibility of taking care of his mother to one of his disciples. This was a man that understood family. He understood the family dynamic. He understood how to connect with family. He wasn't all spiritual. He understood those things. He perplexed the scholars at 12. He also knew family. He also knew business. He also knew trade because he set the example for us of developing intellectually. And some of us, it wouldn't hurt for us to read a book on how to manage our money. Some of us, it wouldn't hurt us to read a book on how to manage our household. Some of us, it wouldn't hurt us to learn a new language or to develop our intellect. I want to say something. Being dumb and ignorant does not glorify God. Now, God has used ignorant people to do great things for him. God has also spoken through donkeys. <laughs> and the, we don't want to be at a place where we stay at the donkey level. God can use me, he can use a donkey. You know what? But he can use you better if you can push away some of that ignorance, take on the form of a learner, and begin to grow and begin to develop. You see, the Bible says in Proverbs 10, 14, wise men store up knowledge. It starts with with, with attaining knowledge. I mean, there's a lot of information out there, and that's where it starts. There's a lot of information with the Bible, and that's where it starts. But it doesn't end there. Because knowing a lot about the Bible and having a lot of Bible facts doesn't make you spiritually mature. What you've got to do is you've got to turn that knowledge into understanding. And then you turn that understanding into wisdom. This means you have to learn to think biblically. What does the Bible speak to how I raise my kids? What does the Bible say about this problem at work? What does the Bible say about this conflict I'm having with my wife? What does the Bible say about the attitude of my child? What does the Bible say about how I'm managing this money? What does the Bible say about how I should vote on this issue? What does the Bible say about how I should relate to this person I'm having conflict with? How, what does the Bible say? You store up that knowledge and then you learn to think. I mean, Luke 1027 says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. If you say that you want to be all out for Jesus, 
If you say that you want to be radical for him, if you say you want to pursue him with all of your, with everything you are, that includes your brain. Because if you're going to love God, you've got to develop your mind. You've got to learn new habits, new ways of seeing things, new ways of thinking, new ways of understanding things, new ways of processing things, because now you are a believer of Jesus, and he doesn't want to turn you into a person that's just conformed to everybody else. He wants to turn you into a person that can use the principles of his word and can think about life and about situations and about different moments and apply the word of God to your life. Knowledge moves you to understanding. Understanding moves you to wisdom. So let me illustrate with this, this umbrella here. Knowledge says, I understand that umbrellas are for protecting me from the rain. And I understand there's umbrellas out there somewhere. Understanding says, okay, there are umbrellas. And I know how to use them. I, I'm smart enough and willing enough to understand the concept of how an umbrella works. Wisdom says, I know what an umbrella is. I understand how to use it. Now when it's raining, I'm going to take an umbrella with me. Wisdom is the knowledge applied. And the reality is there's a lot of folks that know they're not supposed to do drugs. They have knowledge. They know how to run from the drug dealer, but they don't have wisdom. They don't do what they know. There's a lot of folks that know they're supposed to read the Bible or they're supposed to do this or that or whatever it is, fill in the blank, but they don't do it. There's a gap between knowledge and wisdom, a gap between knowledge in application. And Jesus didn't just grow in information. Jesus grew in wisdom. He grew in application of the word of God. God wants you to get in the Bible. And he wants you to use it. Understand the kingdom of God. Understand how it works. Understand the spirit. Understand how the Lord speaks to you. And seek out knowledge. I remember I, I was young and I was zealous. And I had a passion for uh, healing and miracles and I, like I still do. And I remember I picked up a book called How to Heal the Sick by the Happy Hunters. How many of y'all have heard of the Hunter family? Okay, yes. And I read this book, and it provided a lot of stuff that helped me. And once I was able to apply some of that stuff, it kind of helped me make that next step in that aspect of the ministry. You got to have a hunger and a thirst for what's next. Second of all, you need to develop physically. Say physically. All right, now, focus in on me here. Jesus grew in stature. Now, when I put my shirt on this morning and I decided to tuck it in, I understood I've been growing some, but not necessarily in the right ways. Jesus developed. Now, most of us don't really think about this, but Jesus was in shape. He was a carpenter. Now, you didn't go down to Home Depot and pick up a bunch of two-by-fours back then. You had to cut down the trees. You had to hewn the... I mean, this was work. This, when he started his ministry, he walked the nation from top to bottom three times, a nation about the size of New Jersey. After being... Almost beat to death. History tells us that most people died after a Roman scourging. Jesus carried the beam of the cross halfway up a mountain. 
You see, you have a responsibility to take care of your body. Now, because we believe in healing and miracles, it doesn't give us the right to neglect our bodies. Do you have a physical condition that keeps you from being all that God wants you to be? Seek healing. If you have a physical habit that keeps you from being all that God wants you to be, then stop it. See, here's the thing. We all struggle. The problem is, is most people give up. You got to just stay in the struggle. I mean, I can tell you, there's nobody in this room that loves to eat more than me. I'm just telling you, (laughs) you know, I'm telling you, I I enjoy, I I, I enjoy life and I enjoy tacos. I'm just saying, it's just, (laughs) but the thing is, is sometimes when you love to eat, you're from a good Italian family like I am, then There's a tendency sometimes to overeat or to do some things. You don't give up and quit. What you do is you just get back in the struggle. You get back in, you keep fighting, and you fight another day. You see, you were made to move. You don't want to be at a place where you're ineffective for the kingdom of God Because you've been a bad steward of your body. You want to be able to do what God has called you to do. Paul walked the Roman Empire, which is a lot bigger than Israel, three times. And some of us were so out of shape that after work, we can't clean, we can't study, pray, or worship. We can't minister. We can't make it to church. We can't even have sex with our spouse. And the household is suffering, the kids are suffering, the marriage is suffering, the church is losing out. And you've got a responsibility to take care of yourself. You've only been given one body. Take care of it. You were made for movement. Now, if you haven't taken care of yourself and you hear this message and you say, you know what, I'm going to go run five miles today, you'll probably hurt yourself. But consistent movement. A lot of people say, I'll hear people say, oh, well, I can't, I can't exercise. I'll hurt my knees. Or I'll, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll do the, hurt myself in some way. When you start, do you know that your cartilage, it doesn't repair? You know, you pull a muscle, the body repairs itself. Cartilage doesn't do that. But God didn't make a way for cartilage that every time we walk and every time it pounds, it gets thicker and stronger. And so what happens is people that run and people that do things, they, have, they don't have worse knees because of it. They have better knees because of it because they used it the way God intended it to be used. Let me give you something else. You were made to move. Your brain has two happy hormones in it. Dopamine and serotonin. There's two primary things that help release dopamine and serotonin in your body. And it's the nerves. And you know where the nerves are found? On the bottom of your feet. And it's not, and what stimulates these these nerves to produce dopamine and serotonin is not just standing on your feet. So if, like if you're a cash, working a cash register at Kroger or Publix or something like that, you're not just getting a rush of pleasure while you're like, oh, yes, I'll take your MasterCard. <laughs> but when there is a pumping motion between the feet, then what happens, it stimulates those nerves and it releases dopamine and serotonin in your brain. And you start feeling happy. Some of you guys have been sitting on your duff all day. And then you feel down and you're like binding demons. And you just need to get up and go for a walk. (laughs) 
Because you were made to move. You were made to do things. You were made, you've only been given one body. This body is sacred. It is holy. It is not evil. It is a temple of God and we're to take care of it. Third, you need to develop spiritually. Say spiritually. spiritually. Jesus grew in favor with God. This speaks of his vertical relationship with God. Jesus was in love with the Father from all of the beginning of time. And when he lived on this earth, he exemplified what it looks like to love Father God. And Jesus, he loved the Word of God. He loved to pray. Many times the Bible says he prayed all night long. He loved going to synagogue. He loved going to church. Listen, Luke 4, 16. He went to Nazareth and where it had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Jesus had some healthy habits in his life. Jesus never sinned, which means that he always walked in the fruit of the Spirit. So, when Jesus is in the desert, most of us, we get wiped out by some rogue demon, you know, some little guy. Jesus is in the de desert, he has the devil show up. What does Jesus do to ward off the devil? He speaks the word. But let me tell you, every scripture that he quoted came out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 8, or Psalms 91. It's not unreasonable to think that Jesus had been recently reading Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8 in Psalm 91. And so when the enemy came to him, he wasn't pulling some scripture out of some dusty closet going, I know there's something in here today. That he was taking his fresh manna from heaven that he was getting from the word of God and putting it to use. It said, oh yeah, devil, I happen to be reading in Deuteronomy and, every, and just a smidgen of God's word will refute what you have to say. He used what he was thinking about. And I want to say this, God's not mad at you for being immature. He's not angry at you for being immature. He just wants you to grow. And when you stop growing, he's deeply concerned that you've stopped growing. Just if I had a child that was three years old and they stopped growing for two years, we would take them to doctors and we would try to examine what's wrong. When we stop growing, God wants us to examine. What's wrong here? Now, there's three reasons we stop growing. First of all, it's pride. Say pride. I got this. I don't need to do this. I know this. It's too simple. I can do this. Yada, yada, yada. The second is condemnation. Say condemnation. I don't understand what I'm reading. I can't pray. I can't do very good. I'm a failure at this. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to learn it. I'm never going to grow. I'm never going to get this right. I'm never going to eat right. I'm never going to develop. I'm never going to get my life fixed. Never, 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 never. I just might as well just quit. Condemnation. And the third, Lazy. laziness. You got it, my friend. Is that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And if you don't implement the plan, then you're not going to grow. No investment, no return. And Jesus wants you to grow. Now, spiritual disciplines, they help us to, in the process, to connect with God. But they're also part of the training force. As we saw, Jesus had healthy habits. And we want to be like, in the military, they say you go through basic training, but when you get in battle, they say we want the training to take over. Because if you think about it, when you're in the battle, then it's too late. You just need to do what you need to do, and the training needs to have taken over. When I, when I lost my daughter, one of the reasons that the Lord helped me to process things so quickly 
is because I had a strong history with spiritual disciplines. And even though I was mad at God, and even though I was upset with the Lord, and even though I had a lot of questions and a lot of things that I didn't understand why they turned out, why they turned out, I did have enough spiritual disciplines in place that when I was in a crisis, the training took over, if that makes sense. And, and I prayed, even though my prayers might have looked like, I don't like you very much and I would like to punch you in the face, but I was still praying. I was still talking to God. And we want to be in a place where we're developing spiritually and spiritual disciplines because when the crisis hits, it's too late. You want to be at a place when the first shots of the battle go off, you can't prepare then. You prepare beforehand and when the battle rages and if you've trained and you've conditioned yourself and the training takes over, then you win your battles. You also have to understand that that we're not just jumping through hoops to make God happy. And if I pray and if I read my Bible and I do this and I connect to God and it's all about what I do, that's works mindset and that's not what we're after either, that our connection with God is a real relationship. And so we've got to, the purpose of the disciplines is to give us a context so we can hear what God is saying to us and we can develop the relationship. And so you've got to develop your spiritual senses. Say spiritual senses. You need to know when the Lord is speaking to you, and that can be very personal and can be different from one person to the next because you're an individual person, and God deals with you in an individual way. Like, for example, when I get word knowledge, like, like I did today when I would say, I feel like the Lord's healing sciatic nerves, or I feel like the Lord's doing this. What happens is I'm on the front row, and I don't have those problems, and what happens is, is boom. I'll feel some pain that'll shoot through my body. And I'll go, you know, I haven't had that before. That's not something I was came in here feeling. And I believe the Lord wants to heal folks. So the Lord spoke to me through my body. Now, before I knew that, which that God was speaking to me like that, which I read it in a book from someone else who had learned that, I just thought before I was getting ready to pre preach that I was being really nervous and I was being a wreck. I'm like, you know, I walk into the church, not have any pain in my body, get about halfway through pain, praise and worship. I got a pain going through my hip, pain going through my ankle, pain going through my shoulder, pain going through my neck, pain behind my eye. I'm like, oh my Lord, I'm falling apart. <laughs> but, but I learned that the, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me and that's how he was giving me the word of knowledge. And, that, that I, and it also helps me with compassion because I know what they're feeling because I'm feeling what they felt. So you gotta, you got to hone in. Let me, let me show you something else. Everybody, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine I'm standing here on the front of the church and right next to me is a bozo of a clown. It's got a big old red wig, white face, diamonds under the eyes, big old clown nose, polka dots on his outfit, big old red feet for his shoes. But this bozo the clown's had an accident and he's missing a front tooth. All right, now, how many of y'all could see that? Okay. That's what's called, your, this is what I call, that's your screen, okay? Say your screen. Okay. Now your screen is where the enemy will put pictures of you doing bad things. This is where you can imagine things like Bozo the Clown. But the screen is also where the Holy Spirit projects things. Now, Jesus said that he didn't do anything unless he saw the Father do it. You know, and he might not, he might have been having open visions all the time. But the reality is he probably saw it on his screen. Because you know what? A picture is worth what? 
And God's native language is not English, it's spirit. God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And especially when I was, I was younger and I was really trying to get a word from God, I'm like, I'm like all right, God, I'm going to hear your voice, and I'm going to hear something, you know, and you're going to speak to me. And, and most of the time when I did that, I missed it. And I was looking for God to speak to me in English, okay? But now, a lot of times I just relax, and I'm like, okay, the Lord, he has the ability to communicate with me, and so sometimes he might speak to, some, speak to me through my body. And then the next thing, if I'm looking for something, I'm looking on my screen because he can communicate something so much faster just by seeing the picture of it. And so, so I check that. And what happens is, is you begin to develop. So a lot of times I'm praying for somebody, and while I'm praying, I'm checking in with my screen. Or if I'm prophesying with people, I'm kind of, uh, you know, you kind of develop this ability where you can overlay your imagination on top of the, the, with your eyes open. And a lot of times you're able to check both at the same time. And you'll say, oh, I see this over you, or I see this over you, or I see this happening, or I see that happening. And what's happening is, is you're, you're seeing on your screen. You, get, you just got to, and it can be personal. It can be a little bit different from person to person because God deals with us individually. Uh, one of the things that was, that would, it would happen, there was a, there was a season in my life, and it, it still happens, but I know what it means now, is like, I would feel like my finger was burning. And I would look and I would think, man, this thing's got to be glowing. It looked like E.T. or something. And, <laughs> and I look and it's not glowing, but it's just burning. And, and when I, my finger would start burning, uh, this Luke 11.20 would come to mind. It says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So what, what had happened now, if I'm in a church service or I'm in a room or I'm in an elevator or something, my finger, I feel my finger lighting up. I'm like, somebody's got a demon up in here. <laughs> <laughs> You mess with me, I'm going to throw you in a pit. <laughs> now, the thing is, over, you know, 25 years of living for God, I've had really big encounters with God, and I've had big encounters with, with demons. But you don't live in kind of like the high places. You don't live in like the sensational stuff just happening all the time. At least I don't. But what happens is, is in regular life is the subtleties. You know? Most of the time, God doesn't blow through here like a freight train. It's just a subtlety that we're able to pick on together. And when we step into that subtlety, it unlocks something. And then the supernatural begins to happen. But we live in the subtleties. It's the, the little finger that's burning. You know, it's the fire that you feel on your hand in that, that, that moment. It's the, uh, you know, that scripture that keeps coming to you at, at mine. It's that, the pain that shoots through your body. And that the Lord is communicating with you in a very real and a very relational way. And you've got to get in tune with that. And then ultimately, all of that pushes not toward sensational stories, but an intimacy with him. And a relationship with him. And the, the beauty of it is, is most of us in this room are already experiencing these subtleties that God is speaking to us. But we're just not aware of them. But what happens is when you get aware of it, then you're able to kind of hone in on it. And you're kind of like, okay, oh, that's God speaking to me. And you're able to, and when you hone in on it, you're able to kind of dial in the radio. It's kind of like when you get the, you know, you had the old radios and you would get close to the station and you'd hear it and there was a lot of static, but it was coming through. But it, when, you, when you pick it up and you understand that's what it is, you're able to kind of fine tune the dial a little bit and kind of hone that in. Also, you need to develop 
relationally. Say relationally. relationally. Jesus grew in favor with men. Now, a lot of times we miss this because, like, they did nail him to a cross and people tried to kill him. So it's kind of like, well, obviously he wasn't too good with people, but, you know. But the reality is this, is that Jesus liked people and people liked Jesus. He was persecuted at times, but for the most part, people liked being around him. Sinners and prostitutes liked being around him. Religious leaders liked being with him. Tax collectors like to be in with him. Normal disciples like to be in with him. Normal people came out from their houses and their jobs and their trades so they could see him and be with him, possibly touch him. You know, sometimes, I've seen this over the years, you have sometimes we, we act so spiritual, or we try to act so spiritual, that sometimes people don't like us. And we're like, well, they persecuted the Lord. Persecuted me. It's just because I'm so holy. And I'm thinking, your problem is not holiness. <laughs> it's relational sin that you don't see. Jesus was real, and people liked being with him. He cried at the tomb of a friend. And when people did persecute him, what was he doing? He was having open and honest conversation, which is what most folks will get riled up when you get really honest with them about it. What's the problem here? Well, I'll tell you what the problem is. Most folks don't like that. But it's a sign of healthy living that we don't. Dysfunction ignores the elephants in the room and doesn't acknowledge them and plays, and plays the game and plays the dysfunction game. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus is like, hey, there's a problem here. You see, Jesus grew relationally. And people will generally plateau in their leadership and in their ministry based on their people skills and their leadership skills. Now, your character is foundational. It, if you don't have good character, your life is going to crumble, your marriage is going to crumble, your career is going to crumble, your ministry is going to crumble. Your character is your foundation. But it's not the whole building, okay? You got to have a roof on that foundation. You got to have some other skills and things that you're, that you're adding to that. Like, like, for example, some of us need to learn to, to operate in different social spectrums and different social settings. Jesus was able to connect with the poor. He was able to connect with the middle class. He was able to connect with the rich. He could connect with Jews. He could connect with Gentiles. He could operate in different social settings. Because, let me just tell you this, there's some things that are appropriate in one setting, but not appropriate in another. And it's not being fake to adjust to your setting. It's just being socially aware. And being socially aware is being others-focused, and being others-focused is central to servanthood. Jesus connected with people in work settings, in religious settings, over dinner tables, and on the cross. And we, if we want to be like Jesus, we've got to expand, expand, well, expand our ability to connect with people in different social arenas and different social spectrums. One time, I had a picture on my screen, right? Remember our, our screen? 
And I, and I had a picture on my screen. And I saw this round platform that was like on top of a cylinder. Okay? And the cylinder would like rise, rise up almost like an elevator going up, but it was solid. But it wouldn't rise up all at one time. It would have like, if you imagine like a pie graph, one part going up, then another part going up, then one part going up. And then when all of the parts reached a certain level, it kind of had a voice like, who wants to be a millionaire? It would go, you have now reached the next level. And then, uh, you know, I just, I'd hear this. And then it'd go up. And then when everything would get up to the next level, it would go, you have now reached the next level. But there were some pieces that would shoot way up high, and there were some pieces that wouldn't necessarily move. And even though one part was really developed and would shoot up really high, it wasn't until all of the pieces got to a certain level that you heard the sound, you have now reached the next level. And I understood out of that, the Lord began to teach me about balanced spiritual growth. Is that you can have people that are overdeveloped in one area and underdeveloped in another. And it's not until they bring a convergence to those things that they really get up to a next level. So like, for instance, you can have... Somebody that's super spiritual and loves Jesus, but they're not good with people, and they're a great hermit, but they're not bringing people along. And then you have some people that are really good with people, and they really connect, and they navigate conflict well, but they've got like a two-inch spirituality. And that, even though they connect to people well, and they lead people well, they don't have any place they can lead them to. And so God is wanting to develop balanced growth within us. A growth that we have wisdom, a growth where we, we manage our body well and we can carry out the call that God has put on our life where we grow in our relationship with God and we have an active, vibrant, spiritual relationship with a living God, but also develop the skills to understand people and to love people well and to connect with them well so you can lead them to a place, hopefully, that you've been. Balanced growth. And it's not until we balance all of these things and get them all to a certain level that we get to the next level. <laughs> so as we kind of wrap things up, God's calling you to develop mentally, physically, spiritually, and relationally. Let's look at this scripture. Mark 12, 30, and 31. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That's spiritual development. And with your mind, that's mental development. And with all your strength, that's physical development. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. That's relational development. There is no commandment greater than these. All of us are we're connected. We're a whole person. Our eating, our drinking, our love making, our praying, our money, or whatever it is we do, it's all connected. There's nothing secular. It's all sacred. It's all spiritual. It's all worship unto God. And we develop. Our life, and when we develop our life, we expand our territory. I found in my life that God will deal with me exclusively in one area for a season. 
Cameron, be relational. Cameron, be relational. Cameron, be relational. Cameron, be relational. I'm trying. Cameron, be relational. Then the seasonal switch. Cameron, this is how you lead. Cameron, this is how you lead. Cameron, this is how you lead. Cameron. Cameron, now you need to minister to your wife. Minister to your wife, Cameron. What about this other side? Now you need to minister to your wife, Cameron. What about this? Now you need to minister to your wife, Cameron. Minister to your wife. Minister to your wife. Minister to your wife. Then Cameron, this is how you pray. Well, I know how to pray. Now that's how you prayed then, but now you're at a different place and our relationship is developed and we're at a different, different place spiritually. Now I want you to pray like this. Now, uh, no, that's what you did back then. That was an old habit. Now I'm developing you here. I want you to pray like this. Cameron, now, 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 I'm changing you. I need you to pray like this. Cameron, uh, now you're in a season of worship. Just worship me. There's problems going on. I need to fix this. Worship me. Cameron, uh, you know, I need to do this thing with my kids. Worship me while you're doing it. Cameron, you worship me. Worship me. Worship me. It's about me. Cameron, season changes. Develop your people skills. Develop your people skills. This means you're going to send problem people to me, doesn't it? Develop your people <laughs> skills. <laughs> Cameron, develop your people skills. See, and where we're going to bring all these things together is in the church. I mean, the church, you're going to hear the word. You're going you're gonna to hear how to pray. You're going to get an initial touch from God. You're going to... Deal with relational problems. That's part of the training ground. You're going to learn to serve. You're going to learn to minister. That's why the central piece of the church is discipleship. And discipleship is not so much a warm, fuzzy feeling. And you sit laughing while I tell a funny joke. It's more like you're having conflict with somebody. And you've got to learn how to deal with it. And God's like, give me ten more soldiers. you got to practice. Now, you got to practice on a team. Now, there's still time that you can pick up a Think Orange card, and you can sign that, and you can help somewhere. If you want to learn about other ministries and things, we can get in touch with you. Just mark your card, your connection card there. It's in your seat as well. Just drop that in. I mean, I even have a thing on there, like, like my bane over the last two years. We had somebody that did it, was doing, doing these ditches over here. It's like nobody wants to do the ditches. If you want to do the ditches, at least for the next month or so, help George on the lawn and do the ditches right over here. Still, you got to connect. Maybe it's the mother and daughter tea. Buy some, buy some tickets. They're for sale today. Get those tickets. Chill with your daughter. Chill with other church folks. There's still a few weeks left in the small groups for the semester. You know, hop in a small group. Get there. Just, just jump in. 